So thank you, Gulam Azam, Amdeh, for the joint caller, Jumno. No, madam, I'm at you, madam. Ah, so thank you. Sir, I'm like on live at you. Okay. Welcome you all to this session. I am Dr. Najib Ahmed, Professor of Cardiology, National Heart Foundation Hospital. I am the moderator of this session. This session is Chronic Coronary Disease. This is organized by National Heart Foundation Hospital for the postgraduate students. This is the lecture number 44. Basically, chronic coronary syndrome means chronic coronary stable syndrome means coronary and a stable angina. And today's expert is Professor of Cardiology, National and also present in our Professor Vajilat Nesa Malik, Director our cardiology. And uh, today, two presenters are here. One, Dr. Najmul Laila, Registered National Heart Foundation Hospital. And second, Professor, um, as you said, Professor Tofik Shari and Senior Consultant of Cardiology, National Heart Foundation Hospital. Shona Jai? Yes. Okay. Yes. First of all, I like to invite Dr. Nazmun Laila for her presentation. Dr. Nazmun Laila. Uh, are my slides visible? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, distinguished panelists, moderators, uh, respected uh, my teachers, seniors, and everyone listening in today. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Nazmun from the Department of Cardiology at National Heart Foundation and uh, Hospital and Research Institute. And I'll be uh, talking about uh, the clinical features and investigations for chronic coronary syndrome. Before I begin, I have just a little uh, short clin clinical scenario of a 52 year old gentleman who presented with chest discomfort and shortness of breath on moderate exertion for the last six months. He was a previously diagnosed hypertension with uh, type two diabetes. On clinical examination, his, uh, he was hemodynamically stable with a pulse of 80 per minute and blood pressure of 140 by 90 millimeters of mercury with other, no other remarkable find, findings on physical examination. So what would be the most likely diagnosis in this uh, patient? And what would be the, the steps of uh, investigation that uh, this, uh, we would uh, like to give this patient? I'll be going over the definitions, clinical features, physical examination, investigations for chronic coronary syndrome. The most frequently encountered clinical scenario in a patient with suspected or established chronic coronary syndrome are patient with a suspected coronary artery disease with stable angina symptoms with or without dyspnea, patients with new onset heart failure or LV systolic dysfunction and suspected coronary artery disease. An asymptomatic patient or symptomatic patient on st uh, st with stable symptoms for less than a year after an acute coronary event or after revascularization. Asymptomatic patients or symptomatic patients for more than a year after initial diagnosis or revascularization. Patient with angina and suspected vasospastic or microvascular disease. And finally, asymptomatic subjects in whom coronary artery disease was detected for the first time on screening. The natural history of chronic coronary syndrome is a dynamic one. The disease has a long stable period, but may become unstable at, at any time by plaque rupture erosion. So the disease is actually a chronic disease and mostly progressive even in the clinically silent periods. Clinical features are the patient presents with chest discomfort or angina pectoris. I'll be, uh, I'll be detailing this later. With shortness of breath that may uh, accompany the angina or maybe an isolated symptoms and less specific symptoms like fatigue, undue fatigue, faintness, nausea, numbness, burning sensation, restlessness or sense of impending doom. 
And there'll be features of uh, risk factors and comorbidities like uh, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, uh, chronic kidney disease, which, which is associated with uh, extensive atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease and has adverse prognosis. Patient may have COPD, asthma, a positive family history, and patient may be a smoker. So angina pectoris comes from the uh, Greek word uh, um, uh, angon, which means strangling, and Latin word pectus, which, which, means, uh, uh, which means chest. Um, angina pectoris is a clinical syndrome, which is, which is a feature of chest pain that occurs due to myocardial ischemia, and it has four cardinal uh, uh, features. Location of the um, chest pain is usually retrosternal, and it radiates often to the neck, jaw, to the uh, ulnar aspect of both arms, or to the right arm, or either arm, to the shoulders, to the back, or even in the epigastrium. And patient may not have any chest pain per se, but might have pain in the referred areas, like pain in the arms on exertion, or jaw pain, choking sensation, neck, and neck pain, pain in the epigastrium, and so forth. The character is described to be one of pressure, tightness, or heaviness, like something heavy sitting on the chest, um, strangling, a constricting pain, often a burning pain with uh, uh, associated uh, breathlessness, or the, pain, uh, or the presence of simple discomfort with less specific symptoms like fatigue, faintness, diaphoresis, nausea, burning, restlessness, or a sense of impending tooth. A patient that presents without chest pain but has the other has other atypical features like I just mentioned above, like undue fatigue, faintness. These are described to be angina equivalents, and they are common in women and the elderly population. Duration of this chest pain is usually less than 30 minutes, particularly between three to five minutes. And any chest pain lasting for seconds is unlikely, due to, uh, uh, unlikely to be due to coronary artery disease. This is the location of chest pain on angina. You can uh, clearly uh, see that, uh, appreciate that it can be retrosternal, uh, radiating to the neck, jaw, to the shoulders, or we might just have uh, epigastric pain or pain in the areas of uh, referred areas like uh, both arms or back or epigastric pain. There's a specific relation to exertion. Uh, it, the pain increases with the levels of exertion, increases with emotional stress, and particularly on walking up inclines or against a breeze or in the cold weather. And these rapidly disappear after a few minutes when the factors abate. There's exacerbation of symptoms on exertion after an emotional stress or after taking a heavy meal or waking up in the morning. These are classic features of uh, angina. In general, we paradoxically reduced by further ex, uh, exercise, what, what we call pre, uh, walk through angina, or a similar second exertion will not produce the same angina called warm up angina, and this is due to cardiac preconditioning. Sublingual nitrates uh, rapidly relieve angina within three to five minutes. The angina threshold enhanced symptoms are very considerably from day to day and even very during the same day. This is a, a traditional classification of a patient with suspected angina. A typical angina is one uh, who presents with typical constricting chest pain, radiating to the neck, jaw, arms, precipitated by physical exertion and relieved by rest or nitrates within five minutes. A typical angina is a patient who receives any two of, who meets any of the two above mentioned characteristics. And on angina, chest pain meets only one or none of the above characteristics. The Canadian Cardiovascular Society uh, has an important, gave an uh, important grading system to uh, grade effort angina according to its severity. Class one is angina with strenuous exertion, where uh, there's uh, presence of uh, angina during strenuous activity, like prolonged walking or climbing stairs. Angina class two of angina with moderate exer exertion, there's slight limitation of ordinary activities, and a patient only feels angina chest pain when uh, uh, activities are performed rapidly after a meal in the cold or certain emotional stress and climbing more than one flight of stairs at a normal pace. Class three, when there's angina at mild exertion, normal activities uh, precipitate angina in these patients, like walking one or two blocks, or just climbing one flight of stairs at normal pace. And class four is when we have angina at rest and there are no triggers required. On physical examination, uh, general examination, uh, there may, no, uh, may be no, uh, nothing or much remarkable. Pulse may be normal. A patient may have an arrhythmia. 
uh, uh, patient may have, uh, may have um, hypertension as it is one of the risk factors for coronary artery disease and the complications of hypertension is like retinopathy. BMI may be obese patients are directly related with coronary artery disease. And um, general examination may reveal other signs of comorbid conditions like diabetes, renal disease, and thyroid disorders. On cardiovascular examination, pre-cardial examination, there may be features of valvular heart disease as uh, aortic valvular, aortic stenosis has symptoms of angina, as does hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Even pulmonary hypertension secondary to mitral valvular heart disease may reveal uh, angina due to RV ischemia. Evidence of non-coronary vascular disease, uh, like um, so palpation of peripheral pulses, auscultation of carotid and femoral arteries, as well as assessment of ankle brachial index is important. This is the um, uh, differential diagnosis of chest pain. There are many other uh, disorders that may mimic and general chest pain, like esophageal disorders. These they may uh, simulate or coexist with an angina, and both uh, angina and esophageal disorders are relieved by GT, uh, visceral nitrates. But esophageal pains are relieved by milk, antacids, food, and warm fluids. And esophageal motility disorders have, in, a, uh, in addition, dysphagia as a symptom. However, esophageal disorders must be evaluated in patients with poor symptomatic response to empty channels in the absence of documented ECG evidence of ischemia. Hepatobiliary diseases like cholecystitis may also present with the right upper abdominal pain, epigastric pain, and even pain in the precordium and making angina. However, these usually last for two to four hours, stop spontaneously, and may be asymptomatic between the text and the pain radius to the scapula. Costochondral syndrome, like teeth syndrome, has a and uh, may have anterior chest wall um, pain with tenderness, with with or without swelling of the costal cartilage. Musculoskeletal pain may also have chest pain, um, which are increased with certain movements and inspiration, and there may be an associated history of trauma. Uh, uh, Pulmonary uh, disorders like pneumonia may mimic the uh, angina in, in, in the sense that they may have chest pain, which increases with inspiration, associated cough, but on examination, there's bronchial breath sound, hyperresonant lung pills, and uh, whispering pectoralicky may be present. Pain of acute pericarditis also increases with uh, movement and deep breathing and increases on lying flat. And these are not relieved by restored uh, glycerol nitrates. And on examination, a pre uh, pericardial friction drug may be. Heard. The, uh, the uh, pain, chest pain of aortic dissection is severe, uh, sudden severe tearing chest pain that radiates to the back with asymmetric pulse and it, uh, may, may have hemodynamic compromise. So what are the investigations uh, to do with a patient who presents with the chest, uh, typical chest pain? A complete blood, blood count to, uh, to look for um, uh, other causes of angina, like anemia, which may precipitate angina. Um, fasting, uh, to look for the feature uh, risk factors of coronary artery disease, like diabetes, with the fasting blood glucose and HbA1c. And if this is inconclusive, go for an oral glucose tolerant test. Uh, to look for features of uh, uh, um, fasting lipid profile, go do a serum creatinine with an EGFR, um, thyroid function test, serum uric acid test. A high sense Sensitivity troponin levels are usually done in patients who are suspected to be having an unstable clinical event. However, high sensitive troponin levels in a stable patient, if it is high, it indicates an adverse prognosis. The other investigations are resting ECG, ambulatory ECG, echocardiography, cardiac MRI, chest X-ray. And based on pre-test probability and likelihood of coronary artery disease, certain non-invasive functional and anatomical tests may be done, like exercise tolerance test, the stress echocardiography, CT angiography, SPECT, PET, stress CMR, and finally, invasive coronary angiogram. Investing ECG in a patient with typical anginal chest pain, um, they, they may not, uh, they may have an, in more than 50% of cases, they may have a normal ECG. So resting 12 lead ECG is recommended in all patients with chest pain without an obvious non-cardiac cause. 12 lead ECG is also recommended in all patients 
during a, or an episode of angina suspected to be indicative of clinical instability. Now, this is uh, in a patient with ongoing angina, interval ECG are done to um, look for dynamic ECG changes in the form of ST abnormalities um, during ongoing is ischemia um, because it signifies um, in, in myocardial ischemia and the chance of it um, you know, um, becoming an acute chondrite event. ECG also reveals indirect signs of chondrite artery disease, like the presence of Q-wave may indicate the presence of a previous MI, conduction abnormalities in the form of left bundle branch block, AV conduction abnormalities, and also presence of left ventricular hypertrophy may indicate the presence of underlying aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or hypertension, and these carry adverse prognosis. Also, transient ST changes may indicate an underlying, in a patient with uh, under at rest, may indicate the onset of vasospastic angina. Ambulatory ECG monitoring is recommended in patients with chest pain when arrhythmia is suspected. It is also done to reveal the underlying silent ischemia, particularly common in the uh, elderly and females, and may be done in patients with suspected vasospastic angina. Echocardiography, an important modality, is also used uh, to exclude alternative causes of uh, angina. Diagnosis associated by uh, diseases like valvular heart disease, aortic stenosis, or mitovalvular heart disease, cardiomyopathy, or heart failure that may exist uh, in isolation or coexist with coronary artery disease. Identification of regional wall motion abnormalities are suggestive of coronary artery disease. LV dysfunction following the distribution of a particular territory of coronary arteries typical of patients with MI. More, more than often, LV systolic function may be normal. And in this, uh, in, in this scenario, stress, strain imaging and diastolic dysfunction is particularly important to uh, look for early signs of myocardial ischemia. Chest x are recommended for patients with atypical presentation, patients with signs symptoms of heart failure, and if there's suspicion of underlying pulmonary disease like pneumonia uh, or pulmonary hypertension secondary to valvular heart diseases. This is a, um, I'm sorry. Diagnostic testing is useful when the likelihood of coronary artery disease is intermediate. This is a predictive model used to estimate the pretest probability of coronary artery disease based on age, sex, chest pain, and recently the onset of dyspnea has been included. And you can clearly see that uh, the incidence of coronary artery disease or the probability increases with age of the patient. The dark red uh, shaded regions denote the groups in which a pretest for probability is more than 50%. And in these patients, non-invasive testing is most beneficial. The light green shaded areas, uh, the pretest probability in these patients are within five to fifteen percent, and um, and non-invasive testing may be uh, advised uh, after complete clinical evaluation of these patients. So based on pretest probability, uh, uh, to, uh, to ascertain the clinical life likelihood of coronary artery disease, there's an increased likelihood if the patient has typical risk factors for cardiovascular diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. If he has a family history of uh, cerebrovascular disease, if his resting ECG has SCT wave changes or even the presence of QT or if there's LV systolic dysfunction on echocardiography. So uh, if there's a low clinical likelihood of, uh, of uh, coronary artery disease, and the patient has no previous history of coronary artery disease. And if it's available, um, if it's available, a coronary CT angiogram is preferred. If this is inclusive, inconclusive, then uh, non-invasive testing for ischemia is uh, taken. These, these are uh, uh, offered to patients with a high clinical likelihood and where uh, future revascularization may be uh, necessary. However, local expertise and non-availability is, uh, uh, is a must. And viability assessment is also possible with these non-invasive functional testing. Non-invasive functional testing, if they uh, uh, suggest that a coronary artery disease is uh, present, then uh, anti drug therapy with anti-angina and risk factor modification is done. 
uh, and if these patients remain refractory to these, uh, to uh, refract the symptoms are refractory to drug therapy and lifestyle modification, invasive coronary angiogram is advised. So invasive coronary angiogram is advised for patients with high clinical life likelihood who have severe symptoms that are refractory to treatment. They have angina at low exercise workload and exercise ECG indicates high risk events and LV dysfunction is severe. On invasive coronary angiography, if there's uh, substantial stenosis of more than 90%, revascularization is advised. However, if invasive uh, coronary angiography between, uh, if it is less than 90%, but uh, the uh, stenosis cannot be uh, clearly ascertained from angiography, functional assessment with FFR is done. And if this is significant, revascularization is advised. Uh, and the other um, group, subgroup, when following an angiogram, if there is um, significant, less significant lesion, drug therapy is advised to these patients. So exercise ECG is recommended for a patient who are at intermediate risk. And here we, we, we do this test for the assessment of exercise tolerance, symptom response, are, uh, exercise induced arrhythmia, hemodynamic response to exercise, and event risk in selected patients. However, exercise ECG is uh, less recommended in patients with already an ST segment depression of 0.1 millivolts on resting ECG. And it is of little diagnostic value in patients with a left bundle branch block, um, WPW, pace rhythm, or patient getting a digitalis, because the ACT changes that occurs are very difficult to interpret. Maximum exercise capacity measured in METS is the strongest predictor of mortality. Functional invasive uh, tests include stress echocardiography, single photon uh, emission curve, Com uh, computer tomography, positron emission tomography, myocardial contrast, echocardiography, or contrast CMR. Stress, eco uh, stress echocardiography is uh, safe and inexpensive. The pharmacological testing is done with uh, sympathomimetics like dobutamine and uh, vasodilators like Addison, adenosine and dipyridamol. And they will be used in patients who cannot exercise adequately, who have a problem of uh, spinal disorders or spinal surgery, who has uh, arthritis or patients with lung conditions. Assessment by induction of regional wall motion abnormality and LV dilatation is done with, uh, with the help of stresses. In dobutamine stress tests, we begin with low doses of 10 microgram per kilogram per minute, gradually increasing it every three minutes to 20, 30, and finally 40. And, and note the changes in wall motion abnormality and LV dilatation with the increase in dose of dobutamine. A biphasic response to dobutamine when contractility increases with low doses but decreases at high dose indicates ischemia. Increasing contractility of hypokinetic segments identify hibernating myocardium in a particularly coronary, particular coronary territory. This also helps in differentiating between viable myocardium from scarred myocardium. However, interpretation may be difficult in patients who have a hypertensive response to this stress test um, and have severe mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation. Single photon emotion, uh, sorry, single photon emission computer tomography is done with injection with thallium or technetium labeled radiopharmaceuticals. Reduced specificity, uh, this has a reduced specificity and sensitivity in patients with severe obesity with left bundle branch block and triple vessel disease. High risk, which include, which indicate um, more than 33% annual mortality occurs if a spec shows a post-stress ejection fraction of less than 35%. Stress induces a large perfusion defect. The stress induces multiple perfusion defect of moderate size, a large fixed perfusion defect with L LV dilatation or lung, increased lung uptake, and stress-induced moderate perfusion de defect with LV dilatation on increased lung uptake. PET or position emission tomography utilizes rubidium and uh, 30 n ammonia traces. It provides greater spatial resolution and diagnostic accuracy than SPECT. Both SPECT and PET has higher sensitivity and specificity than the treadmill test. Value, these, this, uh, these, these modalities are valuable in detecting myocardial vi viability in patients with regional or global LV dysfunction. CMR. 
CMR uh, uses MRI and it uses gadolinium as a contrast to evaluate visual wall motion abnormality, ejection fraction, and segmental perfusion. Delayed phase gadolinium enhancement provides information on the location of transmural myocardial scar. MRI with stresses like dobutamine and adenosine are utilized to evaluate myocardium that are at jeopardy. However, it is extremely costly, it's not portable, and cannot be used in patients with pacemakers and ICD. CT angiogram is a non-invasive anatomical test. And um, on CT angiogram, I'm sorry, it visualizes, I'm sorry, it uh, visualizes the conduit artery lumen and wall using IV contrast and has had high accuracy for detecting conduit artery stenosis. Stenosis of more than 90% uh, confirms functional significant stenosis and these patients later go, require invasive uh, angiography. Between 50 to 90% of, of uh, stenosis uh, require non-invasive uh, functional testing with a uh, spec stress eco exercise tolerance test. And those um, showing less than 50% uh, uh, stenosis undergo primary prevention. Conduit uh, angiography is the invasive uh, uh, modality for uh, evaluation. It is used for the diagnosis of suspected conduit artery disease with inconclusive non-invasive test. Non-invasive tests suggest a high non-invasive tests that suggest a high event risk. And immediate in, in, immediate invasive conduit angiogram is done in patients where there is a high clinical likelihood and the symptoms are refractory to optimal anti-angina medication and when angina occurs at low level of exercise. This can be done transfemoral, transradial. However, the complications include bleeding requiring blood transfusion at 0.5 to 2%, death, MI, and stroke at 0.1 to 2%. Invasive uh, procedures are discouraged in patients who, who are not fit for revascular, uh, who are not planning to do undergo revascularization later on, because I mean, like patients with a very poor quality of life or very uh, low functional status. This, uh, this is a, a, a chart showing the high event risk of different uh, testing modalities. For ETT, the cardiovascular mortality is more than 3% per year when the true Duke treadmill score is less, less than or equal to minus 11. Inspect a pet perfusion imaging when the area of ischemia is more equal to more than 10% of the left ventricular myocardium. It is a high event risk. Stress uh, in stress echocardiography, three or more of the 16 segments with stress-induced hypokinesia or akinesia. In CMR, two or more of the 16 segments with st stress perfusion defect, or three or more of the dobutamine-induced dysfunctional segments in, in, um, indicate a high event risk. Conduit uh, CT angiogram um, or invasive conduit artery, and three vessel disease with proximal stenosis, a left main disease, or proximal anterior descending diseases indicate a high event risk. Invasive functional tests, testing of F FFR less than 0.8 on IFR of, of less than 0.89. This is a, a scoring system that shows uh, the uh, 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 risk assessment of primary versus secondary prevention. In secondary prevention, it is actually the annual risk of cardiac mortality. So uh, the risk is highest when the annual risk of uh, annual risk is three percent and above. And in asymptomatic uh, healthy uh, uh, subjects who are advised for primary pre prevention, it is a ten-year risk of cardiac uh, cardiovascular mortality, and very very high risk is above ten percent. So um, to select the appropriate uh, testing um, in patients, in patients who are at very low risk, no diagnostic testing is required. It is the patient with the intermediate risk where uh, a, a decision regarding the type of testing is very important. And patients with a very high risk requires invasive angiography straight away. If revascularization is futile and because of comorbidity and poor quality of life, diagnosis is usually made clinically and only medical management is advised. If diagnosis is uncertain, then non-invasive fun functional imaging are, uh, are advised. 
in the patients with high clinical likelihood of coronary artery disease, like a symptom non-responsive to medical management, typical engine at low workload, ECG showing high risk, direct invasive coronary artery with or without uh, in, uh, confirmation of hemodynamic significance is advised. So what was the most likely diagnosis of this patient? The patient was a patient with chronic coronary syndrome. And this would have been his uh, uh, steps of investigation be, based on uh, biochemical tests to exclude all the risk factors, a complete blood count, fasting lipid profile, the serotonin, serum creatinine, um, UNRME, an ECG, X-ray, and finally an echocardiography. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. What a wonderful presentation. Very elaborate. And it, it was the most difficult presentation I've done in my life. It was such a hard topic. So, uh, next presenter is Dr. Tofik Shariar, and senior consultant of National Heart Foundation. I'd like to invite you Thank you, sir. Assalamu alaikum. As uh, Najmun was saying, it is a very vast topic. And let me see if I can uh, concise it for everyone. So, uh, honorable professors, uh, honorable members of the panel, uh, fellow colleagues, and dear students. So, uh, so we already know that uh, ischemic heart disease is a pathological process. Uh, characterized by atherosclerotic plaque accumulation in the epicardial arteries, whether obstructive or non-obstructive. This process can be modified by lifestyle adjustments, pharmacological therapies, and invasive interventions designed to achieve disease stabilization or regression. The disease can have long stable periods, but can also become unstable at any time, typically due to an atherothrombotic event caused by plaque rupture or erosion. However, the disease is chronic, most often progressive, and hence serious, even in clinically silent periods. Uh, the comprehensive management of a chronic coronary syndrome has five aspects. Identification and treatment of associated diseases that can precipitate or worsen angina and ischemia, reduction of coronary risk factors, application of non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic interventions for secondary prevention, with particular attention to adjustment in lifestyle, pharmacologic management of angina, and revascularization by PCI or CABG. So the associated diseases uh, which uh, can increase myocardial oxygen demand or reduce oxygen delivery may contribute to the onset of new angina pectoris or the exacerbation of previously stable angina. We must, uh, while managing a patient with uh, chronic coronary syndrome, we should keep in mind whether the patient is having anemia, if there is sudden marked weight gain, does he have occult thyrotoxicosis, does he have fever or infection or tachycardia due to any cause? Or does he have uh, any history of uh, substance abuse? And we must take care of the coronary risk factors, high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, his lipidemia, diabetes mellitus, obesity, uh, so on. So let me start by uh, giving a uh, hint into lifestyle modification and control of risk factors. Smoking. We know smoking cessation improves the prognosis in patients with CCS, including a 36% risk reduction in mortality for those who quit. Uh, a Mediterranean dietary pattern with high fruit, vegetables, fibers, polyunsaturated fat, nuts and fish, and avoiding or limiting refined carbohydrates, red meat, dairy and saturated fat, fat is advocated. Uh, and regarding weight management, in a population-based study, lifetime risk of uh, incident uh, car uh, cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality were higher in those who were overweight or obese. Physical, acti physical activity is very important and is uh, uh, over and over uh, reminded to us by different uh, guidelines. Exercise improves angina to enhance oxygen delivery to the myocardium. Every 1 ml per kg per minute increase in exercise peak oxygen consumption was associated with the 14 to 17% reduction of risk of cardiovascular and all-cause death in women and men. 
Cardiac rehabilitation is very important. Exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation has consistently demonstrated its effectiveness in reducing cardiovascular mortality and hospitalizations compared with no exercise in patients with coronary artery disease. Psychosocial uh, factors, patients with heart disease have twofold increased risk of mood and anxiety disorder compared with people without heart disease. Psychosocial stress, depression, and anxiety are associated with worse outcome and make it difficult for patients to make positive changes to their lifestyle or adhere to therapeutic regime. Uh, environmental factors uh, exposure to pollution increases the risk of MI as well as hospitalization and death from heart failure, stroke, and arrhythmia. Uh, influenza vaccination. An annual influenza vaccination can improve prevention of acute MI in patients with CCS, change heart failure prognosis, and decrease cardiovascular mortality in adults over 65 years of age. I must uh, add here that uh, under the leadership of uh, Professor Fazila Malik, uh, National Heart Foundation has, has been a uh, leading advocate in uh, uh, influenza vaccination. And our effort has been uh, recognized with this publication, which was accepted for circulation on influenza vaccination after myocardial infarction and randomized double blind placebo control multicenter trial. And you can see uh, among the leading uh, authors, uh, Professor Fazila Malik. And Professor Sohel Rizal Choudhury from Heart Foundation are there. Uh, now about uh, drugs. Optimal treatment can be defined as treatment that satisfactorily controls symptoms and prevents cardiac events associated with chronic coronary syndrome with maximum patient adherence and minimal adverse effects. The initial choice of antiangional drugs depends on expected tolerance related to the individual patient's profile, comorbidities, uh, potential drug interaction with other co-administrative therapies, the patient's preference after being informed of potential adverse effects, and of course, the drug availability. When we deal uh, with these patients, we have two subsets of patients, one with uh, low blood pressure and other with low heart rate. With the patient with low blood pressure, it is recommended to start antiangional drugs at very low dose. A low dose beta blocker or low dose non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker can be tested. Uh, Evapradine or ranulazine or trimerazine can also be used. And with low heart rate, uh, we must remember increased heart rate correlates linearly with cardiovascular events. And however, uh, uh, in patients with baseline bradycardia, heart rate lowering drugs uh, should be avoided or uh, used with caution if needed and started very low dose. Just one uh, 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 FEG here. There is a mammal named pygmy shrew, which has a heart rate of 1200 beats per minute and has a life expectancy of only three to four months. While a blue whale has a heart rate of eight to 10 per minute and lives for almost 100 years. Uh, so the general strategy in drug management is a beta adrenergic blocker or calcium channel blocker recommended at first line therapy. Several signal line add-on anti-ischemic drugs like long acting nitrates, ranulazine, primetazine, evabradine may pro prove beneficial in combination with a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Regardless of the initial strategy, Response to initial anti-anginal therapy should be reassessed after two to four weeks of treatment initiation. So this is a flow chart. We can see beta blocker or calcium channel blocker is a standard therapy. And depending on the heart rate, blood pressure, LV dysfunction, different other drugs like non-dihydropyridine or dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, granulazine, primetazidine are added on and long acting nitrates are added on as we go on to control the ischemia. Uh, about beta blockers, the dose of beta blockers should be adjusted to limit the heart rate to 55 to 60 beats per minute. Caution is warranted when a beta blocker is combined with verapamil or diltiazem. And in certain patients with recent MI and those with chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, beta blocker has been associated with a significant reduction in mortality and cardiovascular events. When on the other hand, calcium channel blockers do not provide this uh, mortality benefit. Calcium channel blockers like verapamil, diltiazem, long acting nifidipine, and, and amlodipine has been tried successfully uh, for managing ischemia. Verapamil has a large range of approved indications besides ischemia. Long acting nifidipine has been specially well tested in hypertensive antianginal patients when added to beta blockade. And amlodipine is a very, has a very long half life and uh, is effective as once a day antianginal and antihypertensive agents. The long-acting nitrate formulations should be considered as a second-line therapy for angina relief. 
the most common side effects are hypo hypotension, headache, and flushing. And we must remember this contraindicated in obstructive cardiomyopathy, severe aortic valvular stenosis. And co administration with phosphodiesterase uh, inhibitors are uh, contraindicated. Rivarbrine has been reported to be non inferior to atinolol or amlodipine in the treatment of angina and ischemia in patients with CCS. Uh, trials support the use of Everbody as a second line drug in patients with chronic coronary syndrome. Nicorandil is a nitrate derivative of nicotinamide with anti anginal effects. Its side effect includes nausea, vomiting, and potentially severe, severe oral, intestinal, and mucosal ulceration. Trimetazidine, a very commonly used drug nowadays, uh, is hemodynamically neutral. Uh, uh, it's added twice a day with beta blocker, improves uh, effort induced myocardial ischemia. It is contraindicated in Parkinson's disease. And using uh, trimetazidine will re reduce the weekly mean number of anginal attacks, lower weekly nitroglycerin use, lower time to one millimeter ST segment depression, high total, uh, higher total workload, and longer exercise duration at peak, ex peak exercise. Granulazine. Are, is also now used very commonly nowadays to treat patients with uh, uh, chronic coronary syndrome. It's a selective inhibitor of the late inward sodium current. Side effects include dizziness, nausea, and it prolongs QT. QT. It has shown to significantly reduce episodes of recurrent ischemia and worsening angina, and in intensification of antigenal therapy were observed. The antiplatelet drugs are the other cornerstone of. Uh, uh, anti uh, uh, coronary coronary syndrome the, uh, the low dose aspirin we know aspirin acts by reversible inhibition of platelet cyclooxygenase which is normally complete with chronic dosing of 75 mg per day the gastrointestinal side effects of aspirin increases at higher doses and current ev evidence support a daily dose of 75 to 100 mg for the prevention of ischemic events in coronary disease patients without with or without history of prior mi uh, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor are the oral P2 Y2 inhibitors. Clopidogrel and prasugrel are pro drugs and irreversibly block the P2 Y12, whereas ticagrelor reversibly binds and do not trigger metabolic activation. We all know that the if use of clopidogrel is uh, limited to some extent as its pharmacodynamics is dependent on uh, CYP2C19 gene, uh, uh, gene variations. Uh, whereas prasugrel has more rapid, more predict predictable uh, uh, effect, whereas ticagrelor has most predictable effect and ha has a very rapid onset as well as very rapid offset of action. And so when you are referring your uh, patient for cardiac surgery, if you are giving him ticagrelor, he will only have to retail it for one, for one dose. Anticoagulant therapy is recommended with patients with atrial fibrillation and chronic coronary syndrome for reduction of ischemic stroke and other ischemic events. In non-valvular cases, uh, novel oral anticoagulant is recommended in preference to vitamin K antagonists. Uh, dyslipidemia should be managed according to lipid guidelines. Patients with established coronary artery disease are regarded as being very high risk of cardiovascular events and statin treatment must be considered. These are the common statins which we uh, regular which we are available nowadays. You can see that atrovastatin and rosuvastatin at a dose of atrovastatin 40 to 80 and rosuvastatin 20 to 40 is high intensity therapy. And I would like to mention here that a patient with prior history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, LDL of more than 190 milligram per deciliter, and um, uh, in diabetic patients with HbA1c more than 7.5% high intensity statin therapy is recommended. Uh, the AC inhibitors and ARBs uh, can reduce mortality, MI, stroke, and heart failure among patients with LV dysfunction, previous vascular disease, and high-risk diabetes patients. Uh, and another drug, the uh, naprilysin inhibitor raises the level of naprilysin, enhancing diuresis, natriuresis, and microrelaxation in patients with uh, heart failure, LV injection is less than 35%, who remain symptomatic despite optimal treatment of inhibitors, a beta blocker, and a mineral alcohol receptor antagonist. A secubitial blood certain combination is recommended as a replacement for AC inhibitor to further reduce the risk of heart failure. 
regarding hormone replacement therapy, the results from large randomized trials have shown that hormone replacement therapy provides no prognostic benefit and increase the risk of cardiovascular disease in women aged more than 60 years. Now regarding revascularization, in patients with chronic coronary syndrome, optimal medical therapy is the key for reducing symptoms, halting the progression of atherosclerosis and preventing atherothrombotic events. Revascularization by PCI or CABG may uh, relieve angina, reduce the use of anti-anginal drug, and improve excess capacity. So Najmun has already shown this slide. Uh, when there is high clinical likelihood and severe symptomatic uh, uh, symptoms refractory to optimal medical therapy, typical angina at low level of exercise and LV dysfunction suspected due to see coronary uh, artery disease, invasive coronary angiogram is indicated. And now in recent multiple RCTs have shown favorable outcome in patients undergoing uh, revascularization with proper indication. So when a patient has typical symptom, non-invasive testing shows uh, severe obstructive disease, intracoronary uh, invasive coronary angiogram shows uh, a lesion more than 90% in, in di diameter or uh, in intermediate lesions, FFR less than 0.8, uh, or there is a suspected LV dysfunction to coronary disease, revascularization is uh, indicated. Uh, I must uh, uh, put forward the role of uh, fractional flow reserve here. The use of fractional flow reserve to treat coronary coronary syndrome patients has really changed the outcome of uh, this group of patients. The FAME trial has uh, successfully shown uh, improvement in every uh, layer of uh, survival in patients with, uh, prop uh, pro uh, with uh, proper indication. And uh, there was a significant reduction in events in patients treated with FFR guided PCI. So this is the um, guideline, what the guideline says. I don't want to go into details of this guideline regarding uh, uh, revascularization, but what I would like to highlight is the benefit of complete revascularization uh, in uh, all patients undergoing invasive treatment. And meta-analysis suggests enhanced benefit when complete revascularization is performed. A residual syntax score of more than eight was associated with significant increase in five-year risk of death and composite of death, MI and stroke. So uh, these are the clinical scenarios as was mentioned by uh, Dr. Nazun in her presentations. Uh, the patient with suspected coronary disease and stable angina symptoms are treated as we have discussed so far. The, the, the second group of uh, patients uh, uh, with new onset of heart failure or left ventricular dysfunction uh, in, they should be treated with uh, both uh, renin angiotensin system uh, AC inhibitors, ARBs, and adrenaline nervous system beta block blockades like beta blockers. In patients with persistent symptoms, a mineral cortical insert antibody is also indicated. Patients having ventricular dysrhythmia or bundle branch block may be eligible for a, for a device like uh, ICD or CRT. Myocardial revascularization should be considered in eligible patients. Uh, patients uh, uh, with diagnosis of chronic, long standing diagnosis of uh, chronic coronary syndrome, patients with CCS may develop a variety of cardiovascular complications or undergo therapeutic measures, some directly related to underlying coronary disease, and some having therapeutic or prognostic interaction with underlying disease. And uh, in case of patients uh, with recent revascularization or diagnosis based on one year, cardiac function may be improved going to mechanisms such as recovery from myocardial stunning or hibernation, which may be reversed by revascularization. Conversely, cardiac function may have deteriorated even other concomitant uh, diseases like vulvar disease, infection, or arrhythmia. After revascular revascularization or after, after recent stabilization, patients should be monitored more vigilantly because they are at greater risk of complication. At least two visits in the first year, uh, uh, as follow-up. Patients, uh, after more than one year of initial diagnosis, annual evaluation is warranted. Overall clinical status and medication compliance should be looked into. Risk, risk profiles should be properly taken care of. And laboratory, laboratory tests like lipid profile, renal function, complete blood count, and in high-risk patient, biomarkers like uh, pro-BNP um, and uh, troponin can be uh, look for uh, yearly or two yearly.
patients having angina without uh, obstructive epicardial coronary artery. These patients deserve attention as angina and non-obstructive disease are associated with an increased risk of adverse clinical events. Because diagnostic pathways to investigate microcirculatory or vasomotor coronary disease are often not implemented. Uh, microvascular uh, angina, the possibility of microcirculatory origin of angina should be considered in patients with clear-cut angina, abnormal non-invasive functional tests, and coronary vessels that are either normal or have mild genotic deemed functionally non-significant. Uh, uh, patients with uh, abnormal coronary flow reserve or uh, index of microcirculatory reserve and a negative acetylcholine provocation test, beta blockers, AC inhibitors, and statins, along with lifestyle changes and uh, losing regimes, are indicated. Patients developing EC changes and angina in response to acetylcholine testing, but without severe epicardial vasoconstriction, may be treated as vasospastic angina. What happens in vasospastic angina? Uh, it should be suspected in patients with anginal uh, symptoms occurring predominantly at rest with maintained effort tolerance. The diagnosis of vasospastic angina is based on detecting transient ischemic STT change, extended halter monitoring, intracoronary administration of acetylcholine as uh, provocation tests are preferred. In patients with epicardial or microcirculatory vasomotor disorder, calcium channel blockers along with long acting nitrates a treatment of choice, in addition to control of cardiovascular risk factors and lifestyle changes. Prazosin, a selective alpha adrenaline receptor blockers, have shown well in some uh, uh, some occasions. What about uh, refractory angina? Refractory angina refers to long-lasting symptoms more than three months due to established reversible ischemia in presence of obstructive coronary disease, which controlled, which cannot be controlled by escalating medical therapy. This uh, group of uh, uh, and also after a PCI. Uh, this group is uh, really uh, difficult to manage and multiple uh, therapies have been tried like external kind of counterpulsation, extracorporeal shock, shock wave, uh, coronary sinus constriction, neuromodulation like spinal cord stimulation, gene therapy has been tried with uh, very little success. Now, uh, before I end, I would like to uh, say a few words about some special subclasses like women with CCS. They make up less than 30% of uh, population in different trials. A difference in uh, symptoms of presentation, the accuracy of that, uh, lack of accuracy of diagnostic tests, uh, uh, always uh, keep them out of the trials. It is therefore recommended that, that women who present with signs suggestive cardiac ischemia undergo careful investigation, uh, stress echocardiography, with exercise or dobutamine stress is, is an accurate non-invasive technique for the detection of the coronary disease and risk on women with suspected CCS. Elderly patients, uh, elderly patients uh, high incidence and prevalence of coronary disease in both men and women. Uh, they present with a typical symptom which delay proper uh, diagnosis. Treatment of CCS in elderly is complicated by higher vulnerability to complications for both conservative and invasive strategies like drug interaction and other uh, comorbidities like bleeding, renal function, neurological uh, impairment. Uh, deaths with short duration of DAPT may be, there, may be a good choice for them if uh, reverse prevention is intended. Uh, and again, an, another group is uh, patients with cancer and uh, chronic coronary, sy coronary sy syndrome. Occurrence of cor uh, coronary disease in patients with active cancer is increasing as a side effect of cancer therapy. Treatment decisions should be subjected to individualized discussion based on life expectancy, additional comorbidities such as thrombocytopenia, increased thrombo thrombosis and bleeding propensity. In cancer patients with uh, increased uh, frailty, the least invasive reversion procedures are recommended. And finally, screening for coronary artery disease in asymptomatic subjects it is an effort to lower the high burden of coronary death in asymptomatic adults. Uh, numerous measures of risk factor and risk uh, markers as the well stress tests are often performed as screening tests. A subject with family history of premature coronary disease should be screened with familial hypercholesterolemia, coronary calcium score, ankle brachial index, carotid ultrasound for plug detection may provide useful. Routine use of biomarkers or other imagings like CT angiogram are not recommended. I think uh, I will end here. Uh, we are almost running out of time. Thank you very much for your uh, patience here. Thank you.
Thank you, Tafik Shahri Arhat, for your beautiful presentation. I'd like to invite Dr. M.J. Ajam, Professor of Cardiology and ICBD. Please tell something about the chronic coronary syndrome. Unmute Kottavya. Sorry, sir. Thank you, sir, inviting me to say something regarding chronic coronary syndrome. Actually, I must say Dr. Nazmun and Dr. Tofik nicely covered all aspects of chronic coronary syndrome, including in depth they discussed. I just give a simple example how he covered, how she covered in chronic coronary syndrome, a stepwise approach in chronic coronary syndrome guided by ESC. All the steps are covered by Nazmun up to step five. One, two, three, four, five, up to diagnostic approach. Five, six is for management approach is covered by Taufik. And he nice, she nicely elaborated, suppose, what are the investigation? In usually exam purpose, we usually ask, what are the mandatory tests in case of chronic coronary syndrome? How you explain it? Suppose she nicely showed for chest X-ray and echo, SRAM creatinine, why that, that's our class one indication for going for investigation in chronic coronary syndrome. And supplementary, he also, she also shows why go for chest x-ray, why go for eco. So I think if anyone follow our lecture, they are able to answer in every aspect of examination setting, setup. And also Tofi also vastly covered all aspects of other complications like other clinical scenarios, difficult clinical scenario also included. So I think that will help us a lot. And if we follow and if, if we are careful, then we can answer and we can practice in our daily life. And second thing, sir, we must remember which one is much more clinically applicable for our patients, especially whose group we should treat, whose group we should not to treat, and how we should treat. That is the main principle. And it's also covered by Taufik very nicely. Sir, that's my comment, sir. Thank you very much. If any question and answer from any audience, then we can appreciate it. Anyone, please? Professor Badu Jaman. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Uh, can anybody answer? What is linked angina? Yeah. Sir, sir may I try? Yeah, sure, sure. Why not? Linked angina is a typical angina uh, chest pain that occurs in uh, gastroesophageal reflux disorders. The reason why this chest pain occurs is because they share a esophagus and the uh, heart shares a uh, vagal efferent supply. So you have a chest pain in the precordium. So a GRD has a precordial chest pain, typical of angina. However, many patients with GRD present to emergency and you just uh, exclude them as a gastroesophageal disorder and send them home. But unfortunately, these patients have a high risk of developing uh, coronary artery disease later on. So uh, they need to be uh, closely evaluated afterwards, you know, on follow-up. Uh, actually, the GRD actually mimic uh, the chest pain, ischemic chest pain, and surprisingly, the pain of GRD re relieves with GTN, sublingual GTN. Yes. Because it causes asphyxia spa relaxation and acid reflux decreases. So that adds to the confusion because the patient comes with uh, chest pain and which is relieved by GTN, sublingual, but it is due to GRD. So it is more confusing. Thank you, Dr. Actually, both as uh, Professor Azam has already mentioned, both the lecture was already uh, was very good. Uh, nothing more to add, actually. And uh, uh, chronic stable angina is a very vast subject, as the both have said. That it's very difficult to um, complete all the aspects in a single lecture. But still, they have tried their best to compile all the information in, uh, in their lectures. Thank you very much, both uh, Dr. Nazman Mahar and Dr. Taufik Shahjara. Uh, excellent. I think. Uh, the main aspect of chronic stable angina is when to ask the patient for evascalation. That's the uh, that's the uh, critical point. 
uh, may I ask Professor Azam, uh, what's your opinion? Just leave, leave the uh, guideline. Guideline is for uh, is there, but what is what is our real world situation? The real world situation. When you will advise a patient with CCS to go for an uh, coronary angiogram and vasculation, Professor Azam, can you just share some thoughts on it? Sir, thank you very much, sir. That is the actually, sir, very much gray zone in our clinical practice. Actually, how should we make our decision? Though there is some recommendation in case of, and then uh, uh, angiogram in case of CCS, uh, there is a, if you have C plus C, uh, three or four symptoms or stress test very highly suspected for coronary disease in that particular situation or patient have history of sudden cardiac, death, uh, cardiac arrest, then you can consider coronary angiogram. But uh, most striking point in our clinical practice is sometimes angina with heart failure patient. And sometimes we can predict that might have a very severe coronary disease in that particular situation, despite patient having all intentional medication, plus one and plus two drugs already getting, but not just responding. Uh, in that particular situation, we should offer coronary angiogram if that is uh, significant coronary disease, especially very critical coronary disease like left vein or bifurcation depletion or multiple disease, then we should recommend it is revascularization. But if you look at the ischemia trial, they told that there is no significant difference between this revascularization and medication. But in the, these subset, special subset groups are excluded from the ischemia trial. So I think there are much more waiting in future. But in we solve our clinical practice by doing reverse position, by doing angiogram, and if need, that is go for reverse position if it is possible, CBG or PCA as it is indicated cases. That is our usual practice in our clinical scenarios. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Professor Ajam. But for example, a patient comes with class two angina. For the first time, he uh, came to a doctor, uh, to visit a physician, and he is describing he is having class two angina. So will you advise, you definitely will prescribe some medicine for him or uh, the patient. And will you advise that the patient should have an angiogram? No, not necessarily. Firstly, if patient come to me, class three angina symptoms, I should go for medication as definitely, but I have to go for risk stratification. First of all, then what the risk stratification, if I convinced this risk stratification is very high, then I'm considering with optimum medical medication, then I can take decision either he or she might need for coronary angiography or not and proceed further accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, uh, Dr. Azam. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. So I think Professor Fazila Malik, Adam. Just. Hey, thank you. So this has been such a interesting session. I mean, uh, it's like a, a huge, huge, like Meghna got covered most of the time. We started and then we went on and on and layers upon layers upon layers of information. And both of our speakers did such a wonderful job. And this is, uh, and, and actually, I mean, when you talk about real life scenario, like Professor Budi was among the six, class two angina, what will you do? Will you ask for an angina? And these are like real life problems. Like maybe, yes, if the patient has multiple comorbidities, if the patient has a very strong history of coronary artery disease, and the patient also wants to have an angiogram done, because even after maximum anti-angiogram therapy, he's still having a bit of problems and he wants to lead a very active life. Maybe we'll, we'll do. So, I mean, guidelines are there to guide us, but I think every patient is unique in the clinical scenario that he comes along with. And that's why we have to treat the patient and the guidelines, we should be there to guide us. But I think we should also, you know, be a very caring physician and always try to do what is best for our patients. And best does not always translate to doing intervention. Best for one patient, maybe, you know, giving him uh, advice about uh, lifestyle modification, making him stop his smoking, making him take his drugs. For another patient, maybe it would be early intervention. So 
each patient comes with his unique set of problems and we have to address that as physicians. I think that is also maybe a message that we need to take from this uh, class. But, uh, but uh, the speakers were fantastic and I must uh, thank uh, Professor Ghulam Azam for kindly attending this session and vastly enriching our session by his gracious presence. Thank you so much for joining us. And so Professor Nazir Ahmed, it's getting quite late. Do we say goodbye now? Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. I like to conclude this session just now. Everybody, thank you very much. And hopefully, we will see the next session. Thank you very much today. Okay, bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Wonderful, Fantastic. Bye.